On this podcast, we have often mentioned Yuri's Night, but what exactly is it? Well, it's coming up on April 12th, so we figured we'd best find out. And to do this, we're joined by the executive director of Yuri's Night, Tim Bailey. We'd love to know if you've ever been to a Yuri's Night event. Tell us all about it at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please do continue hitting that share button for us. It's much appreciated. But right now, enjoy episode 84 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 84 of our podcast. So, Emily, do you remember where I talked about Facebook? And yeah. the, the new podcast tab thing that exists there, and the fact that the podcast uploads straight to the page if you're on your mobile in certain countries. Well, it's been working. However, when the posts go on the, on our news feed, if people comment on them, I can't reply. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're rolling this thing out and it's all over the place. So if you're sending little messages on those threads, please note I can't reply at the moment. Hopefully they'll change that. But at least people are seeing it, which is good. And hopefully that might reach a few more people. Anyway, you've been busy. A couple of new articles, Emily, right? Yeah, I uh, wrote a couple articles that got published this week. I wrote one for Celestius, which is about some of the adventures some of uh, Celestius's participants have been on during their lifetime. We got some really interesting, awesome people who have uh, participated in our Memorial Space Flight, so go check it out. And uh, I did an article for the National Space Society for my This Space Available blog on uh, Skylab's reentry. I have written about that before, but this one's has a bit of a twist because uh, I talked a little bit about the ground stations and how uh, nice. Ascension, yeah, and how Ascension Island was the last uh, place to give them commands or give Skylab commands. And I also, uh, my next one in that series, whenever I get to writing it, is going to be about uh, the Australian response because, uh, yeah, as we know, uh, Skylab kind of dumped a little bit over Australia. So. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've we've spoken about that before, and we uh, we love the video that exists of the news broadcasting that happened in that night in Australia. It's great to, if you find it on YouTube. I'll actually I'll put a link in the show notes. Why not? Once again. Yeah, it's fun. I, I love the fact you've called it part one of your Skylab articles as well. I'm always I'm always a fan when I see the words part one. Like yes, yeah. there's going to be more. Yeah, there's going to be several. There's going to be a. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm yes, planning several. on at least two, but I'd like to I'd like to do several. I love. <laughs> I love doing series that have like like, like ten pieces because that's I'm just that's how big of a nerd I am. Nice. There's gonna be at least a part two, but who knows? It might it might just become a several parter just because I'm like, hey, there's so much to talk about, you know? <laughs> yeah, of course. So, is there a <laughs> limit on how long a blog can be? Does the NSS tell you how long a piece can be? They do not have a limit for me. Um, writing on the internet's a little different from writing other stuff. Like it's different from writing like a book chapter or something, you know, or a book. Books tend to be very long, which is fine. That That's what they're for. But um, when you write like a blog or something, most of the people are reading it, obviously, on their mobile phone or they're reading it on a computer. And I try to limit it. And I've gone over this before. It's not really strict, but I try to limit it to about 1,500 words. Because if you go to like 4,000 words, people are going to just stop reading. <laughs> Dude, that's <laughs> like this is long, you know. But um, I try to keep it to roughly fifteen to two thousand words, just because you know when you get it super long, it's more of a book chapter, it's more of a feature article, which is fine. But you know, a blog post, m- most people kind of lose interest after about fifteen hundred words. So yeah, that's the rule I use. But it's not it's not really set in stone. I've written long long blogs in the past before, and people have read them. Yep. So it really depends. Mm. Well, uh, stuff I've never considered before, but there you go. Anyway, on to this week's interview. Emily and I have both mentioned Jury's Night on the podcast before, so we thought we'd give you some more information about what it is and what's happening. And so we're talking to one of the big dogs. Yep, we're joined by Tim Bailey, who serves on the board of directors for Jury's Night, in addition to supporting events as a member of the global executive team. 
In December 2016, he stepped up to become the fourth and current executive director for Yuri's Night. Tim is one of those people you probably haven't heard much of, but he is involved in so many different things that you're probably aware of much of his work. We are thrilled that he's joining us today. Well, if you haven't changed any, it's really something else. I tell you, John has been telling me about it for three years, but ain't no way you can describe it. Well, thank you, uh, Tim, for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. And tell us how Yuri's Night got started and what exactly is it? Sure. It's great to be here. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy to be on with you and Dave. Yuri's Night started because space was not fun. Uh, there were some <laughs> students and young professionals that crashed uh, a United Nations conference called Unispace 3 back in early 2000. They really thought about hard how to get young people involved in space and how to inspire young people to, to have more fun and, and really engage with the space industry. And one of the ways they figured out to do that was by celebrating the human aspects of space. And so they actually pitched the idea of a space holiday to the United Nations as sort of a general idea that came out of these uh, students and young professionals crashing this giant professional space conference. Uh, and the United Nations actually listened and said, hey, you know what, that's a pretty good idea. We're gonna make this amazing world space week and we're gonna have it between the launch of Sputnik and the signing of our outer space treaty. And it's gonna be a whole week where teachers do all these education things. And they looked at each other and said, yeah, cool. That is not what we meant. Uh, <laughs> that's gonna be great. You do that in October. We thought it was really obvious that you would use April 12th as the International Day of Human Spaceflight Celebrations because it's the dual anniversary of Gagarin's launch and the launch of the first space shuttle. That's a really cool cosmic coincidence. Uh, it also happens to be the birthday of Loretta Whitesides, who is one of the founders of Yuri's <laughs> Night. She said, I know it's cool because it's my birthday. Why don't we have a party that day? So they let the United Nations start World Space Week, which is also an ongoing celebration. But they just got together with some of their friends that they had met there and said, you know what, we're going to have a, a party in L.A. And a bunch of their friends said, well, we're going to have parties on the same day if that's OK with you. We want to party with you all around the world. And so there were 63 parties in 2001. Wow. Uh, including a, a flagship party in Los Angeles. And everybody had such a great time that when they got done the next year, they said, you know, we should do this again. We should just make this an annual event that everybody celebrates the incredible power of space to bring the world together in celebration. And we're going to do it with music and we're going to do it with art and we're going to do it with science and culture and really blend these things together in a way that we don't see happening in other places or in other media. In 2004, I got involved. George and Loretta Whitesides were two of the co-founders. They had also started in with Zero Gravity Corporation being flight attendants and getting involved with parabolic flight to let people experience the, the power of weightlessness. And that's where I met them and, and thought this was such a cool idea that I got involved as a volunteer and have now worked my way up to being on the board and executive director and helping to produce our two parties in LA and, and KSC along with inspiring and supporting parties all over the globe uh, and even as far away as Mars so far. <laughs> nice, nice. So you have two official events then, and then there's other things going on. Tell us about the official events this year. Sure. So we produce two signature events because we like to have parties too. Yeah. Uh, and then everybody <laughs> else around the world is encouraged to have their own party. It's like the St. Patrick's Day of space, right? You can do <laughs> anything you want at your Yuri's Night. Straw rockets at a daycare, uh, you know, shots at the bar. If you want to watch space balls at home with your kids, that still counts. Uh, but we do want to make sure just like a city might have a signature St. Patrick's Day event, you know, a parade or a, a dyed river. We have LA and Space Coast. So out in LA, we have a lot of Hollywood stars that show up. We have about 2000 people that come out to the California Science Center. Nice they place. They dance underneath the space shuttle out yes. there, which is exciting to be under Endeavor uh, with DJs and astronaut speakers. We have a uh, table set up this year for a lot of different organizations that are in the area. It's people that want to get jobs, could come out and talk to some people like Planet uh, that's going to be out there that does the space imagery. We'll have Paragon Space Development Corporation talking about the things they're doing on the moon. It's going to be amazing. And then we also have artists out there. Uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who is a geophysicist, a geologist, a, an artist, and now an astronaut from Inspiration4 is going to be giving our keynote address as nice. well as presenting the very first JEDI Space Awards. JEDI is Just, Equitable, Diverse, and Inclusive. Uh, so that's our theme for the year as well for the LA event. 
And then we have an astronaut DJ that's going to play. We have Chris Bosshausen, who went up on New Shepard just last year <laughs> nice. and is now coming to play for us uh, at Yuri's Night, which is insane that we have an astronaut DJ that's coming, uh, as well as a bionic pop artist that was part of our Astro Access crew creating accessibility for disabled people in space. Victoria Modesta is going to do a custom show for us uh, that's never debuted anywhere in the world before. So there's so much incredible thing. And Blue Origins Club for the Future is going to be there. They're going to allow everybody at the party to create their own artwork on a postcard. They're going to send it up to space on New Shepard and then mail it back to people with a flown to space stamp. Nice. So if you come to Yuri's Night in LA or at <laughs> Kennedy Space Center, you could have your own artwork flown to space and returned to you, which is just mind blowing that we live in that world. This is amazing. When is the LA event? The LA event is this Saturday, April 9th. Uh, okay. We kick off things at around uh, 6 p.m. Excellent. And then the, the Space Coast Kennedy Space Center event is the following week, right? Correct. So we wait one week so that we can all recover and make it to both <laughs> parties. Uh, and we do that one at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex under Space Shuttle Atlantis. So you have two opportunities to dance under space shuttles. We also have Cyan Proctor coming. We also have Chris coming to spin over there. Uh, and we're going to do that on the 16th of april i think i'm an ambassador at the kennedy one so I, you are I, you are yeah i'm so excited i'm very excited i have my outfit planned and everything <laughs> and i'm ready to have a great time under atlantis i've never actually been to a party under atlantis and that'll be incredible because i've seen that space shuttle launch many a time so that's really special so you talked a little bit about this um in the last question but let's talk about unofficial events like can anybody host a Yuri's Night party? And is there a place where people can find out more if there's anything happening near them who might not be able to get to, say, L.A. or Kennedy Space Center? Sure. We encourage people all over the planet to host events. And part of how we support them in that is by giving access to all of our branding. So that's our logos, our, our, our name. Uh, we also have resources online that help people figure out how to plan an event. So if you go to yurisnight.net, and look under resources, we have all kinds of information about how to start your own party, how to do branding and marketing for the party. And we also host a global map of events. So if somebody's having a party and they would like to invite other people to come to it, they can put that event on our global map. And so you can look and see what might be going on near you or around you, uh, including things that are going to be online. So I know there's already a couple in Europe that are talking about doing some online broadcasts so that anybody around the world could tune into those as well. There's going to be a huge party up in Seattle uh, at the Museum of Flight, I know, uh, as well as some other ones going on uh, around the planet. So check out the yuriesnight.net, look for a party. And if there's not one, you still have time to go and do it. It doesn't have to be on April 12th. Like I said, it's just like doing St. Patrick's Day. You can do it on a weekend or a weekday around that, whatever works best for your schedule and engages the community you want to be in. We've seen people do all kinds of interesting events uh, that bring in local culture or specific local groups. We did one in Kennedy Space Center many years ago that was about global diversity. And so we had hula dancing. We had a group that came in and was showcasing some of their dancing skills. And if you've never seen an astronaut in a hula skirt doing the hula, it's amazing. <laughs> it really shows that like we bridge cultures and we bridge different groups, uh, thinking about the planet as one whole planet and one whole globe instead of uh, all these little individual places on it. So um, absolutely, we encourage people to do that and we help them as much as possible uh, through publicity and through resources online. I uh, think Story Musgrave is going to be at the Space Coast one. I think he is, which is kind of neat. XS-11 is still going strong in yes. space flight, which is pretty amazing. It's been a while since they got selected and it's neat to see him out there doing stuff. That's really cool. Absolutely, yeah. Love seeing story involved. Anyway, I need to make it a little bit serious just for a moment. Uh, I've seen some stuff on Twitter suggesting that Yuri's Night is pro-Russian and therefore some pushback this year due to what's going on in Ukraine. I'm sure you've had to answer questions about this. What do you say to people who take issue with Yuri's Night because of this? I completely understand. Uh, this is not the first time that we've we've had questions about that. And certainly we take that seriously as well. We celebrate and we use the name Yuri's Night uh, specifically because a Soviet cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, went up into space during the Cold War and came back down with a message of peace and unity for the planet. He said, the world is so beautiful, we should be working together to protect it, not fighting over it. Mm. 
And as the first person to ever go into space and the first person to come back with what we term the overview effect of really understanding that the planet is one ecosystem, that we're one species of people that should all be working together, we find that really empowering. And we also look at him as the first human to go to space. We're not celebrating his uh, specific launching country. We're not looking at the, the rationale that put him there but the mindset that he came back with uh, and the people that have followed along after that. So we put out a statement reaffirming that we are absolutely against uh, the aggression and the war that Putin has put on, uh, that we firmly support the Russian people that have been out protesting uh, that and understand that a leader does not always uh, represent the people that, that are in their country, not all people uh, represented by a single leader in a single action. And affirming that we stand with Ukraine and we stand with peace. We really want there to be peace in the world. And that we feel like having a time when we celebrate the unlimited potential of this human species and the things that we can do when we work together is really important, especially when things aren't going well. That we remember there, there can be a light side and there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. So we want to be a candle in the darkness and say, we stand with everyone else. And we really want this to be a thing that we can celebrate together. Even if that means you don't celebrate it with the words Yuri's Night Attached, that's okay. That's yeah. okay with us. We, we don't mandate any of those things. We don't <laughs> tell you how to do it. And I think that's important to recognize that you don't have to call it a specific thing, but we want that specific message to be in people's hearts when they're creating these events and, and putting something together for their community, that it brings people together and doesn't drive them apart. So we're happy to do whatever other people want um, as far as their events go, but we're keeping the name Yuri's Night for the events that we host for sure. And that is how you answer that question. Right, before I let you go, I want to ask a bit about you and your involvement with the Zero-G company because my understanding is you have done loads of Zero-G flights and I just want to know a little bit more about it. I know this is moving away from Yuri's Night slightly, but I still think it's something really interesting that our listeners might like to hear about. Absolutely. Uh, my history with Zero-G and Yuri's Night are intertwined, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I came on, I had I'd met someone uh, in high school, actually, uh, when I first toured Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University down in Florida, and he ended up getting hired by Zero-G as their director of flight operations and brought me on as an intern when I was still in college. I had just graduated. And I said, this sounds great, but Zero Gravity Corporation is a space tourism company that's going to be using an airplane to do these parabolic arcs and give people weightlessness. Sounds great, but I don't do airplanes. I really want to do space. And he said, that's perfect. I need somebody that doesn't understand this so that they can read it and help us refine this from an outside perspective. So I actually came in as the unknowledgeable observer uh, helping to write and do a lot of the paperwork. And, you know, so there was folding pages and putting manuals together and reading over things. And eventually I did learn what was going on and how incredible it was to give people this opportunity to be weightless the same training that Gagarin went through, that they put the Mercury astronauts through, that most astronauts have been through in their lives. And so Zero G from uh, 2004 on has been flying people of all kinds all over the United States. Uh, we have a plane that, a 727, uh, Boeing 727 aircraft. We take it all around the United States to different airports uh, and give people the opportunity to go up and experience true weightlessness. They're really in free fall just like the astronauts. And in fact, many of the astronauts that you see going up on the commercial providers today have actually come and flown with zero G prior to that. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity for their brains to start acclimating to being weightless, to how little force you need to move around, and even to practice some things that they might want to try when they're out uh, on their spacecraft. So it's a, it's a great way to do that. I've been on over 350 flights uh, wow. in my time. Uh, so I've got over 8,000 parabolas, which is a couple of days worth of zero G time built up over the past 18 years. It's been incredible. And I strongly encourage anybody that would like to go, go to gozero.g.com and look up the flights that might be happening around you. Uh, they are not cheap, I will say, for most of us. Uh, they're about $8,500 a seat right now. But when you compare that to going to space, yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty good deal, especially if you know that's going to be part of your space flight training that you need uh, to break into that industry. So, uh, absolutely, it's, a, it's so fun. Does it ever get old? No, no, it doesn't. There's always something new to play with and have fun with. We we get water out and play with it, and water just is so different when the surface tension of the water is the thing that's driving how it moves. But I still find stuff that I haven't done before. 
And I just got to bring my kids up for the first time. Oh, yes. So my wife wow. and I had been, and now our kids are old enough. They need to be eight. So now we have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old, and we all got to go and fly together. And the looks on their faces and the way that their brains just really expanded what was possible for them was truly incredible. And I'm really excited to see more kids get to come up. Uh, Yuri's Night actually did a, a partnership with Zero-G for a thing called Mission Astro Access, where we took up 12 disability ambassadors. So they were researchers that all had different types of disabilities. Some were blind or low vision. So we had several deaf. And then we had some mobility uh, disabilities, which included people who used mobility chairs and prostheses. And they all went up and showed that all of them could operate effectively in a zero-G environment. They could understand cues that we were giving them for when we were starting and ending our parabolas. So if they had gone up on something like a suborbital flight, they would have been fine to move around the cabin, get back to where they needed to be, uh, and land safely, which is just huge. And now they're pushing that research forward to say, how can we improve the spaceflight experience for everyone by making some universal accessibility improvements so that everybody gets better cues about when things are happening so that everybody can move more effectively in these environments. Uh, so it's really pushing forward accessibility in spaceflight as well, which is an amazing partnership to have between Yuri's Night uh, and Zero G. I love having both parts of my life be able to work together on something so incredible and so impactful for so many people. Absolutely. I remember we talked about that briefly on the podcast when it happened and we saw the news report. It, we were both very excited that that happened. We think it's a really important thing. It is. And we're actually going to have some of those Astro Access ambassadors both in LA and at KSC this year. So Emily, you'll, you'll have some of those other ambassadors with you will be from Astro Access. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. That's a really awesome program and I'm glad something like that is finally happening. Okay, so to finish, what's the end goal for Yuri's Night and where do you see this going in 20 years? That's a big question. <laughs> Yuri's Night as a nonprofit has our mission to use the awe and power of space as a catalyst for developing the next generation of explorers. One way we do that has been through these Yuri's Night celebration events, just getting people comfortable with the idea that they belong in space, whether they're a chef or a soccer mom or a computer programmer or an artist, it doesn't matter. There's a place for you in the space program and space it. You are part of the crew of Spaceship Earth. Uh, and so the real goal for Yuri's Night is to have that idea permeate all of human culture. And that a thousand years from now, when we're spread out across the solar system and maybe other solar systems beyond, we all remember that first time that a human left the planet and realized what a gorgeous place it was and that we needed to work together as, as one human family and one crew of Spaceship Earth to really protect and enhance our planet and not fight over it. And so that's what we want Yuri's Night to be is that one holiday that Earthlings all over the universe remember and look back to and say, we started off all in the same place. And it doesn't matter that we're in different places and in different times. We can have a time when we recognize that this was a human achievement and we've we've made it as a species out in space. Smashed it. Well done. Thanks so much, Tim, for joining us today. This has been wonderful. I've had a smile on my face the whole time. I love your energy. So you thank too. you very much. Uh, and good luck with this year's events. Uh, hopefully I'll join you next year. That'll be great. Yeah. Well, where are you? I'm in London. So uh, hopefully uh, travel will be easier next year and I can start planning a few things. I feel like we have something going on in London, so I'll have to see because there are several people in the in the London area that would love to get together for Yuri's Night. You absolutely. should just do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well absolutely. Why not? Good you idea. Take a pub and just tell people to meet you there, and like find an outdoor table and have your own Yuri's Night. I think that's such a good idea. I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> it's <laughs> easy. Uh, yes. In fact, I'm already picking a date. We're going to go London Bridge on the 11th, Monday the 11th. If anyone wants to come and party on Yuri, Yuri's night, I'm going to put some details in our show notes for that. Brilliant. That's some good stuff. Woo! I love right. it when a plan comes together. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we really enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs> All right. 
I am so excited. Full disclosure, I'm going to my first series night uh, on the 16th. I'm going to the Kennedy Space Center one. I'm staying in the area. I know a few of you who are listening to the show are also going to it. Um, and I, I couldn't be more excited about it. I even got an outfit. Just call me Ranch because I'd be dressing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Seriously, like <laughs> this sounds so stupid. When I had surgery earlier uh, in March, that was like the thing. Like, man, I got to be ready by Yuri's night. That was like my one thought. And then I went under and then that was it. <laughs> I, like, I got to be recovered by, from this crap by Yuri's night and stuff. And I'm, I'm almost there, but I'm so excited to go there, be an ambassador. On a serious note, I, I'm really excited. They're doing things to promote, you know, inclusivity like what Tim was talking about when they on the zero G flights, when they flew, you know, differently abled uh, people on the flight. I, I thought that was fantastic because, you know, as we expand into uh, space further, there's going to be people, you know, not have a leg or something going up. There might be somebody who, you know, is paralyzed going up. You know, it's not just going to be one type of person this time. Things have to change. You know, the, the roles have changed in society. You know, we're going to see everybody's going to have to do it. And I really think that I love their message and I love that's part of it. So I think that's that's really cool. And I, I love that they promote it. And I love that Dr. Cyan Proctor is doing the, the Jedi Awards. And I think that's going to be really exciting as well. And I'm really excited about being an ambassador this year. Mostly I'm excited. God, I've used that word a thousand <laughs> times. Mostly I'm excited about being able to I don't drink anymore, but I'm excited about being able to party under Atlantis. Oh, because yeah. It's such a beautiful ship and and having seen it launch a million times it's kind of surreal like <laughs> seeing it right above you i'm just super pumped i can't wait to go amazing yeah i thought he was a great guest as well loved his energy i think he handled all the questions really well uh, there was a difficult one in there for him and i think he absolutely nailed it i think that shows how good this organization is that they handle these kind of situations really well. And I'm serious on, on, I know it's a Monday night, but Monday the 11th, if anyone is in London, anyone wants to travel to London to come and meet me in London Bridge, I'll put something in the show notes. I'll also put some stuff up on social media. Maybe I'll try and tie it in with me doing some songs, doing a performance of some kind, do some load of space songs. Why not? Hey, why not? Yeah, why not? That'll be that'll be really cool. Yeah, it may, may not be under the Space Shuttle to Atlantis, but we haven't got one. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm hoping that once this COVID stuff hopefully clears up even further, you know, you can come over and, and experience one. And this is my first Yuri's night. I, I've, I think in 2020 and 2021, I did them online, uh, obviously because of the pandemic. But um, this is my first one in person. It's going to be awesome. So and uh, I know some of our listeners are going to be going to these events. If you see me at the Kennedy one, please feel free to come up, say hi. And we'll hang out. Uh, I'm I'm just excited about getting out and doing stuff again. So it, it's going to be absolutely it's going to be great. It's going to be great for sure. As always, you can watch the full unedited interview if you sign up to be one of our Patreons, which you can do at patreon.com slash space and things. And within the show notes, we'll have links to the events and other things discussed in the interview. You can find the show notes on space and things podcast dot com. All right, we have a lot to get through today in terms of news. Hopefully, we'll do this justice. But as always, you can find links to full articles about everything we're talking about in the show notes. So if you want to learn more about any of this, just have a look there. There have been four launches since we recorded last week. One in China, one in New Zealand, and one at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Those three were orbital flights with various payloads, which you can find in the show notes. But we've also had one suborbital flight with a six-person crew. Yes, Blue Origin launched a New Shepard rocket from their launch site in West Texas on 31st of March. So let's have a look at the crew. First up, Gary Lai, the chief architect of the New Shepard system. He joined Blue Origin in 2004 as one of its first 20 employees. The company started in 2000, I believe. And since, he has been involved in product development, strategic planning, and business development for all Blue Origin product lines, including the New Glenn Orbiter launch vehicle, rocket engine programs, and the Lunar Lander. Then we have a married couple. Nice. Uh, Sharon Hagel, who's founded Space Kids Global, a nonprofit founded in 2015 to encourage students in math, science, technology, education, and art. 
and to pursue careers in space. Uh, her husband, Mark Hagel, is the president and CEO of the property development corporation Tricor International. Next up, we have Jim Kitchen, who is a professor at the University of North Carolina's Kenan Flagler Business School and an entrepreneur who has visited all 193 countries recognized by the United Nations. And finally, George Neild, who is currently the president of Commercial Space Technologies, but has had many jobs in space flight, including being the manager of the Space Shuttle Program. That's a pretty big deal. Yep. And he uh, also served as associate administrator for the Federal Aviation Administration's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which actually regulates commercial space activities. Yep. And I guess these flights are becoming more regular now. Maybe it's not as exciting as it was when they were starting a year ago. I don't know. But I loved watching the video of this. I particularly enjoyed the guy who, as they're going up, was shouting out, we're going to space. I thought, yeah, that would be me. That would definitely be me. <laughs> yeah, right? I would be the idiot yelling some stupid stuff or something. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. And uh, and the, the married couple shared a, a brief kiss on, in space, which I thought was also quite cute. And And why not? Why not? Also, I wonder, and I'm sure I could just Google it, but never mind. I wonder whether Jim Kitchen has become the first person to visit all 193 recognized United Nations countries and gone to space. That, you know, that's a really interesting thing. Um, I have no idea, but that's interesting. Yeah, he might be. He might be the first one. I'm sure he knows. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would know. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, I can't can't think of any astronauts who, who have done that, or well, who have advertised they've done that. I'm sure there may have been one or two, maybe. We'll find yeah, out. It's, it's possible. Or if anyone knows, it, just let us know. Save me having to research it. That would be appreciated. Yeah, just, just hit <laughs> us up and, and let us know about it. Yeah, Absolutely. So after all our talk about the Artemis 1 rocket last week, well... They've been hit by some delays again. The wet test, which we talked about last week, was delayed. The first attempt was 3rd of April and was called off due to safety concerns with ground equipment on the booster's mobile launcher platform. And when they restarted the test on April the 4th, they had another problem with a stuck vent valve on the mobile launch structure. So don't forget that a wet test requires the rocket to be fully fueled. So obviously stuck valves are definitely going to be a problem. And I've just found out that the test is going to take place after the Axiom 1 launch on Friday the 8th. Uh, I'm not sure if the same day, probably not, but after that launch has happened. Anyway, Emily, I don't know if you saw this. Four lightning strikes hit the area around launch pad 39B during a storm on the 2nd of April. And the fourth of these actually hit the tower. There's a, a lightning protection system, which it hit. So there's a pretty cool clip on the link if you check the show notes. Uh, but NASA have said that despite these lightning strikes, the rocket remains in good health, which is crazy, but good. All very reminiscent of Apollo 12, obviously. Yeah, I was about to say just hit SE to oxygen. Yeah, happen. exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it'll take care of everything. It'll just It's like a Robitussin for rockets. Just Weirdly. Just button. I think I was wearing my SEE to Orcs t-shirt on April the 2nd. That's funny. I oh was. I was wearing that t-shirt on that date. That's really blown my mind. Anyway. That's awesome. Meanwhile, on the ISS, the International Space Station, uh, shortly after we recorded last week, Russian cosmonaut Anton Shklaparov, <laughs> I think I said his name right, handed over the keys uh, to the station and NASA astronaut Thomas Marshburn as he takes command of the station. Uh, Shklaparov? also made a powerful statement during the ceremony saying, people have problems on Earth. On orbit, we are one crew. I think ISS is a symbol of the friendship and cooperation like symbol of the future exploration of space. The next day, uh, he returned to Earth alongside fellow cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov and NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei. The three landed in Kazakhstan in their Soyuz spacecraft, and Vandehei is now back in Houston as he starts his recovery from his record-breaking stay on the station, becoming the record holder for the longest single space flight by an American astronaut having reached 355 days in space. And I have to say, before we go to the next news story, he looked pretty sensational given that he's been up there that long. Absolutely did. And uh, yeah, all the speculation also 
ends over whether that was going to be a successful transition as well as with what is going on. Um, of course, after all this cooperation and goodwill, up steps Dmitry Rogozin, the head of Russia's Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, who was tweeting again about the sanctions imposed on Russia due to the current conflict in Ukraine. Uh, he said this on April the 2nd, and this is a Google translation of the Russian text. The purpose of the sanctions is to kill the Russian economy, plunge our people into despair and hunger and bring our country to its knees. He continued with, I believe that the restoration of normal relations between partners in the International Space Station and other joint projects is only possible with the complete and unconditional lifting of illegal sanctions. So some news outlets have been reporting that that means Russia are pulling out the space station, but... To me, it seems unlikely that the station is any in any immediate danger. Uh, after all, Russia did just launch three cosmonauts to the station. And if the actions of the organizations and the crew recently are anything to go by, NASA and Roscosmos are still very much cooperating, uh, despite Rogozin's tweets and public pronouncements. Yeah, that guy's a trip. Uh, <laughs> anyway... <laughs> And while we're talking about the ISS, there are two crewed missions preparing to go up from the U.S. on SpaceX Dragon capsule shortly. This week, we're due to see the first fully private mission to the station with the Axiom 1 mission. The crew of four have been delayed again by the delays and the wet test of the Artemis 1 rocket. But the crew of four are currently scheduled to launch on April 8th for their 10-day mission, of which eight are going to be on board the station. Uh, we'll cover this more once the launch has happened. Also, uh, the knock-on effect of these delays has pushed the flight of the Crew-4 mission back to April 20th. Meanwhile, on Mars, the Perseverance rover has discovered that the speed of sound is different than on what? Earth. Low-pitch sounds travel much slower than high-pitch ones, and this could have strange consequences what? for communications on the planet. Of course, perhaps this isn't really a surprise if you think about it, because the speed of sound is always dependent on the density of the material in which sound waves are travelling. And we know that air on Mars is the composition of the air on Mars is different to Earth. But now we have some proof. And I guess knowing exactly how this works is essential for potential human travel to the planet. So I'm a big fan of this story. Also, it was announced today that Ingenuity has just completed its 24th flight. And they're preparing for the 25th very soon. Wow. That's that's inc that's crazy news. My mind is just exploding uh, hearing that. I'm like... That's nuts. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? But it yeah, does. when you hear it, when you see it written down, you're like, what? It just messes up everything because I remember in like engineering school, you always have the speed of sound and it's yeah. like a, it's like a constant, you know? And now yeah. I'm like, wait, it's not a constant anymore? Like what? <laughs> that is crazy to me. Elsewhere, China's Zhengzhou uh, 13 crew, I think I said that right, are intending on heading back home from the Chinese space station after six months in orbit which is a national record for the Chinese. Uh, we don't yet know the exact date, but it should be in mid-April, according to the chief designer of China's human spaceflight program, Zhao Jianping. The crew have been very busy performing a number of experiments and have also managed two spacewalks during their time on board the Tiani module. Uh, when the crew leave the station, their capsule will be deorbited for a landing near Dongfang in the Gobi Desert, Inner Mongolia. Emily, I just want to congratulate you because I have given you all the hard names to say this week. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if I got all of them right, but I tried. I think I did okay. Great job. Great job. Thank you. And finally, there's a new animated film on Netflix called Apollo 10 and a Half, A Space Age Childhood, and it looks really cool. I'm hoping to watch it over the weekend. I'll post the trailer in the show notes. It's directed by Richard Linklater, and it takes viewers back to 1969, and it's a coming-of-age story that takes place in Houston. I'll hopefully have feedback for you next week, but have you seen the trailer for this? It looks amazing. I have, and I can't. I, I haven't watched it yet because I was hoping to watch it this weekend as well. Well, it looks amazing. It, it reminds me, God, as you do, I have friends, you know, their parents worked in the space program or their parents were actually astronauts and they lived in Houston and, and they're, you know, I see their comments, you know, on Facebook and stuff. And a lot of them were like, oh, my God, this was like my childhood. And I'm like, I can't wait to see that. That looks very moving. And I'd like to understand a little more kind of what they went through. So I can't Absolutely. wait to see it. Yeah. 
Obviously, we spoke about that a lot with Bruce McCandless when he was on yeah. the show, Bruce McCandless the third. So yes, and and Patrick Mullane as well. Um, so yeah. yes, uh, I, I think this is going to be great. I can't wait, can't wait. Hey, it's flat, John. Wow, there's that ridge to the north. Yep, sure is. Yeah, I'm All we got to do is jump out the edge and we got plenty of rock. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, uh, thank you to all who continue to support what we do. And thank you for pressing the share button. Uh, we hope that you're still here next week. And uh, we just surpassed a, a historic uh, uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of downloads, which Did is we? officially more people, more than, 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 you know, there are people on earth. So <laughs> that's pretty incredible. So I just wanted to, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> My husband told me to say this because on every podcast I listen to, that they're always bragging at the end about the number of downloads they got. Like, thank you for giving us 10 billion downloads or something. And it's like, oh my God. So I was like, we gotta, I gotta outdo everybody. Be like, well, we have more downloads than there are people that there are probably living beings in the whole world, like the universe. So whatever. Yeah. Cheer- cheers, Steve. Thanks very much. Appreciate Dave's that. Dave's like, thank you for ruining our podcast. Well, yeah. in fact, we've had. 3,000 downloads in the last 30 days. So close to 6, six billion. Um, yeah, that's, we're getting that's there. not bad. We're getting we're there, getting that's there. for sure. Um, okay. <laughs> but in the oh meantime, but before we get there, we are busy to help us get there. We're busy making plans for the next couple of months, which reminds me that in space, no one can hear you scheme. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions. <laughs>